Hello, I'm Michael Milam, Interim Pastor of Amazing Grace Lutheran Church in Lawrenceville, Georgia, and I hope you are blessed by the hearing and preaching of God's Word today. So about a month or six weeks ago, I began my sermon by saying that uh, the most cherished uh, human experience and relationship for most people is their families. And I think uh, in general that's a kind of a universal thing that we have come to accept as Christians. Indeed, most of the Christians that I have known and worked with in the parishes that I have served believe that, that our commitment to our families supersedes any other commitment or priority. And not only do we believe that, but we seem to take it for granted that that's the kind of commitment that Jesus would have us make towards the members of our family. And so we may indeed find it somewhat mystifying and uh, disturbing to hear Jesus say what he says in today's gospel reading when he speaks out and he says, Who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? Dismissing, apparently, his biological family that is present there waiting to see him and saying, whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Now, Jesus' family in today's gospel reading has come out. We're told to restrain him. He's come home, and naturally as a rabbi who has gone off and kind of gained a reputation and, and, and made good for himself and, and earned a following, uh, there are many people who have come out uh, at home to listen to him teach about the kingdom of God. But there are some who have reached the conclusion that he's a lunatic, that he's out of his mind, uh, and others who have accused him of casting out Satan by the power of Satan. And of course, Jesus counters uh, the ridiculousness of that claim by saying, how can Satan cast out Satan? And yet his family remains there wanting to talk to him. Presumably they have come to take him home, to get him out of the uh, spotlight and away from the controversies that he is stirring up all around him. And so his teaching is interrupted by someone who says, hey, your, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside and they want to talk to you. And then Jesus makes the comment, who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? Those who do the will of God are my brother and sister and mother. So what is Jesus trying to do by making that declaration? Is he, uh, is he speaking negatively about his own family, about the biological family, those whom we cherish in our lives? Or is he simply trying to expand our notion of what a family is? In the same way that he expands the definition of who a neighbor is elsewhere in the gospel tradition. In the 10th chapter of Luke, there is a lawyer, uh, an expert in the law of Moses, who has come to test Jesus and to try to trap him. And in that story, he, he ends his, his dialogue with Jesus by asking the question, and who is my neighbor? And then Jesus, in response to that, tells a, a very well-known and beloved parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And as you know, in that parable, uh, a man is beaten and robbed and left beside of the road for dead. And then along come the good, upstanding, upright religious folks, the, the priest and the Levite. And they happen upon this man who is bleeding and dying, and they put their own busy schedules and their worry about ritual contamination ahead of their duty to act as a neighbor to the one who is beaten and suffering beside the road, and they pass by this man. And then along comes a Samaritan, we're told in that parable. Now Samaritans, of course, were hated by Jews because they had supposedly intermarried with foreigners, uh, you know, mixed, uh, mixed race marriage, mixed culture marriage, and because they had adopted supposedly pagan rituals into their worship of God. And so a Samaritan would never be considered a neighbor. I think most of us to this day still think of a neighbor as someone who lives nearby us, uh, next door or across the street, someone with whom we have 
much in common, someone that we would be comfortable relating to. And the Samaritan does not fit that category at all. And yet the Samaritan comes along and has compassion on the man who is dying beside the road and cares for him. And so, in telling that story, Jesus shatters our boundaries of who is and who is not a neighbor, just as he attempts in today's Gospel reading to, to, to expand and, and shatter our somewhat limited notion of who belongs to our family or to God's family. A neighbor, indeed, can be anyone. And it, it does not necessarily have to be someone who is like us, who looks like us, who talks like us. Uh, but whenever we encounter such a person, uh, no matter how different they may be, the expectation is that we will love God and love neighbor by reaching out to that person. So that expands our understanding of who a neighbor is. Uh, and it, it is the same with our notion of the family. As I explained to the children a few moments ago, ordinarily what we say is that through our baptism, we have been brought into the family of Christ, into what we call the church. And, and just like our biological families, we don't necessarily get to choose who our brother or sister in Christ is. You know, we can't choose our moms and dads. We can't choose our siblings. Often we would like to, but we can't. Um, and likewise, our parents can't choose the genetic makeup of their children. We simply have to receive and try to love each other as God has made us and, and as God has made them. And it's the same in the church. You, you are baptized into the congregation, and immediately you are adopted into a family of, of many other folks, some of whom you might never choose to relate to if it were up to you. And yet, because of their common faith in Jesus and their commitment to following God's will, they are part of the kingdom of God. They are kindred to you. They are part of your family. And of course, this can be a very diverse group of people when you consider the enormity of the church across the world. Although it has been said uh, many times, and I'm sure you've heard this as well, that the church is probably the most segregated place on the planet on a Sunday morning. And certainly that is true of the majority of the congregations I have served through the year, save for this one here. Um, you know, all of the congregations I have served previously have been predominantly white, almost exclusively Caucasian congregations. And often this... Uh, this uh, um, identification of the church as a segregated community is said as a way of trying to challenge us or perhaps shaming us or, or encouraging us to get out, to reach out beyond the limitations of those who are like us and bring in, invite the diversity of God's kingdom into our midst. And often, uh, as I've received it, this critique of the church has been leveled at Caucasian congregations primarily. But I think that's not exclusively true. Just this uh, past weekend at Senate Assembly, um, Perry Moss and I sat down and had lunch with a group of people who came together who wanted to talk about multicultural ministry. And it wasn't a, a large group of people. There were only four of us at the table. Three of us were white. One was named Mary and she is a member of a predominantly African-American Lutheran church in Atlanta. And she, like us, was looking for ideas and direction on how their congregation might begin to reach out beyond the limitations of the makeup and dynamics of their church as it is into uh, the Asian, Latino, and white communities and invite them, draw them into our midst. And so uh, we, we are members of a very diverse body and, and group of people in the family of God. And, and, and this is true through our common baptism in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is the way we ordinarily talk about how we come into the church. But in our gospel today, 
Jesus doesn't say anything about the standard of baptism being the way we are brought in to the kingdom of God and made kindred with one another. What is the one expectation or requirement that he mentions? Anyone who does the will of God can become part of the kingdom, can be recognized as kindred to him and become part of his family. And of course, this, uh, this is a, a unique and different way of thinking about the family of Christ, isn't it? Throughout the centuries, we have made right belief and right doctrine of, often the, uh, uh, the limitation or, or the, uh, the category of who's in and who's out, uh, that we believe the same. We recite a creed oftentimes on Sunday morning. If you believe all of these things, you can be a member of the family of Christ. But Jesus says, no, it's not right belief or right doctrine. It's right action. It is loving God and your neighbor as yourself, fulfilling those greatest commandments. And that would seem to be an un-Lutheran stance, wouldn't it? Because we've always been taught in the Lutheran tradition that we are justified by our faith in God's grace for us and not by what we have done, not through our efforts or good works at serving uh, our neighbors, loving our neighbors. Well, I don't want to uh, shock anyone into cardiac arrest this morning, but uh, folks, Jesus wasn't a Lutheran. And he said that if you do the will of God, I recognize you as my brother and sister and mother. That it would seem that that is another way for us to think of who we are kindred with, who we are related to in the family of Christ. And I've got a couple of examples to throw at you. I think most of us have known people uh, through the years, very, very good people, people who seem to have a value system similar to our own that we would acknowledge as a Christian value system, and people who uh, give generously of their time volunteering uh, in hospitals and soup kitchens uh, for Relay for Life, uh, many other activities uh, that we would acknowledge as, as in keeping with the, the Christian mission and outreach that we try to, uh, to maintain in our congregations. And yet, those people will tell you they're not Christians. They don't believe in God. Perhaps they were raised in the church uh, and have become uh, dissatisfied or disenchanted with the church uh, through the years. Uh, they don't have a religious bone or impulse in their bodies. And yet, through their actions, they, uh, they behave as you would think someone who is a follower of Jesus would. Now, what are we to make of that? And, and, and what would Jesus make of it? Well, going by what he has to say to us in the gospel, I think he would look at that person and say, you are kindred. You can be my brother or sister or mother. Now, let me take that example just a step further for you this morning. Um, let's say this hypothetical person I'm talking about is a part of a faith tradition. I'm not talking about Catholic or Presbyterian now. I'm talking somebody who is Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim. Now, I'm sure that's a, a challenging notion for all of us, given the, the history between uh, people who practice Islam and those of us who consider ourselves Christian. Uh, there's been quite a history of violence over the centuries, and especially in the last uh, 17 years or so in this country. But we share many things in common with those who are practitioners of the faith of Islam. For one thing, we believe in one God, uh, just as they do. And we are both people of a holy book. Theirs is known as the Quran. And we share many common ancestors in the faith. In their holy texts, uh, there is mention made of Abraham and Moses, and even Jesus, folks, although he is not regarded as Savior 
or uh, the Son of God. He is regarded merely as a prophet in the Quran. But if uh, a Muslim person is expressing their love for God and their devotion to God and to their neighbor through their actions, are we able then to open ourselves up to embracing him or her as a brother or a sister and a member of the kingdom of God along with us? I know that that's a, a challenging notion, an idea for you, but nobody ever said that Jesus' teachings were easy or simple. And I believe it's a very relevant one to us in our day and our culture. Can we acknowledge those who are otherwise very different from us, who express their love and devotion for God through their actions towards other people, through their love of neighbor, as our kindred, as our brothers or sisters or parents. A few weeks ago, our gospel reading was out of the Gospel of John, and we heard Jesus say to a man named Nicodemus, unless you are born of water and the Spirit, baptism, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. In today's gospel reading, we hear Jesus say something quite different from that. He says, if you do the will of God, then you can be my brother or sister and members of the kingdom, the kingdom now of God. We are kindred, and you are members of my true family.